Hey there, econ students. Yesterday, I published a video in which I went over every graph from the AP Macro course in just under 10 minutes. Now, I had to go over nine graphs in 10 minutes. So when I set out to make a video covering every AP Micro graph, I wanted to do that in 10 minutes as well. But when I went through the AP syllabus, I found out that there are actually over 25 graphs you have to know for AP Micro. So I have bad news. I had to take 12 minutes to go through every graph, but that's what you're about to watch. I go through every graph from the AP Micro class. Not only do I illustrate the graph for you, I explain it as well. So enjoy the video. Please subscribe to my channel. And if you're studying for the AP Micro exam, follow the link below to my website where you can order yourself the ultimate AP Microeconomics class notes. I've also got the notes for AP Macro as well. And if you haven't seen the video covering all the AP Macro graphs yet, please go back to my channel and check that one out too. Let's see if I can do it, guys. 12 minutes to cover 26 graphs. Here we go. Let's start with the PPC. We'll put one good on each axis, good A, good B. You could also put capital goods and consumer goods. This is a straight line PPC representing a constant opportunity cost between the two goods. A point inside the PPC, such as point X, represents an inefficient or underutilization of resources. Point Y represents an efficient utilization of resources. And point Z is not possible, but could be through economic growth. Moving on to supply and demand, we've got price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis. We've got a downward sloping demand curve representing the inverse relationship between price and quantity and an upward sloping supply curve representing the direct relationship between price and quantity. Equilibrium is at the intersection of supply and demand, PE and QE. Now what happens if there's a shift in one of the curves? In this case, we're going to show a shift in demand outwards, representing an increase in demand. There's a temporary shortage of the good is at the old equilibrium price. The quantity demanded exceeds the quantity supplied, but the equilibrium will be restored when price increases to a new equilibrium at the intersection of the new demand curve and the supply curve. Anytime there's a shift in demand or supply for a good, you're going to see a change in equilibrium price and quantity. Be sure you're familiar with the determinants of demand and supply before you move on to the next video. Next, we'll talk about consumer and producer surplus. We're going to start with the market in equilibrium with the equilibrium price and quantity and we'll identify our area of consumer surplus as the area below the demand curve and above the equilibrium price. This represents the additional happiness of consumers who paid less than they were willing to pay. Next, we'll identify the area of producer surplus, which is the area below the price and above the supply curve. This represents the extra welfare of producers who sold the good for more than they were willing to sell it for. What if the market is out of equilibrium at a price such as P1? At this price, which is higher than equilibrium, we have a deadweight loss. We have a loss of total surplus in the market. Consumers are worse off because they're paying a higher price price therefore have less surplus and producers are better off because they're selling for a higher price. At any price other than PE there is a dead weight loss. That's a very important point when talking about consumer and producer surplus. Let's move on to government intervention in markets. We'll start with the price ceiling. This is a maximum price set below equilibrium meant to make consumers better off. Notice that it creates a shortage in the market as the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. Consumer surplus increases but producer surplus decreases and overall there's a loss of total surplus creating a dead weight loss in the market. Next, we have price floors. This is a minimum price set above equilibrium meant to help producers in a market. Notice that a price floor creates a surplus or an excess supply where the quantity supplied is greater than quantity demanded. Producers are helped. Therefore, there's an increase in producer surplus, but consumers are worse off. And overall, once again, there's a loss of total surplus, creating a deadweight loss in the market. Time to look at per unit taxes. Recall that a per unit tax is a determinant of supply. Therefore, a tax is going to shift the supply curve up vertically by the amount of the tax. Remember, supply also equals marginal cost. The increase in marginal cost causes a decrease in the equilibrium quantity to QT, an increase in the price consumers pay to PC, and a decrease in the price that producers get to keep to PP. There's a decrease in both consumer surplus and producer surplus, and there's a burden imposed on both consumers and producers. The green rectangle represents the consumer burden of the tax. The purple rectangle represents producer producer burden of the tax, and the black rectangle represents the tax revenue generated by the tax. And once again, just like in all government interventions, there's a deadweight loss as total surplus decreases in the market. Time to look at the effect of a subsidy. This is a tricky one. A subsidy is also a determinant of supply. It lowers the marginal cost for producers, therefore shifts the supply curve outward or down vertically by the amount of the subsidy. This causes an increase in equilibrium quantity to Q1 and a decrease in the price that consumers pay, but an increase in the price that producers get to keep because they're being subsidized on top of what consumers pay. Now, there's an increase in both consumer surplus, which is yellow here, and producer surplus, which is blue, that overlap each other. Overall, however, the cost of the subsidy to taxpayers, outlined in black, outweighs the benefit in the increase in consumer and producer surplus. Therefore, there's a loss of total surplus, a deadweight loss. Once again, subsidies create deadweight losses because total cost to taxpayers exceeds the total total benefit to producers and consumers. 
Next, we're going to look at an import tariff. This is a tax on goods imported into a country. So we have to show both the domestic demand and domestic supply, but also the world supply. Assuming that the world can produce the good more cheaply than the domestic producers, the world price, PW, is lower than domestic price. Without any intervention, the quantity supplied domestically would be less than the quantity demanded domestically. A tariff increases the cost of imported goods, shifting the world supply curve upward vertically by the amount of the tariff, raising the price to PT paid by domestic consumers. This causes an increase in the domestic quantity supplied to QS, a decrease in domestic quantity demanded to QD, an increase in domestic producer surplus, yet a decrease in domestic consumer surplus. Overall, there's a deadweight loss and an increase in government revenue resulting from the tariff. Let's move on to business economics, or theory of the firm. We're going to start with productivity curves. This is how much output is attributable to each additional worker hired. So we're looking at the quantity of labor. Marginal product is upward sloping because of increasing marginal returns and diminishing marginal returns. Average product increases until it crosses marginal product, then it decreases. The downward sloping range of marginal product represents the range of employment over which the firm experiences diminishing marginal returns. Its productivity also dictates the shape of a firm's short-run cost curves. When marginal product decreases, marginal cost increases. When average product decreases, average cost increases. The AVC and ATC curves must cross the marginal cost curve at their lowest points. That's very important. Let's look at the long run average total cost curve. This is basically the same as a short run ATC curve. The only difference is the explanation for why it slopes down and slopes up. When ATC is decreasing, the firm is experiencing economies of scale. When it reaches its lowest point, the firm has achieved minimum efficient scale. And when ATC is increasing, the firm is experiencing diseconomies of scale or decreasing returns to scale. Remember, the shape of the ATC is the same in both the short and the long run. The only difference is the explanation for that shape. Let's now look at a perfectly competitive firm in the short run. We've got cost and price on the vertical axis. We've got the horizontal marginal revenue and demand curve. This is determined by the price in the market. Marginal cost slopes upwards. It crosses the marginal revenue curve, and that's the profit maximizing level of output for the firm. Firms will always produce where MC equals MR to maximize the profits. Now, this firm is experiencing economic profits because at the MC equals MR point, the price is higher than its ATC. In the long run, of course, we're going to see that these profits are eliminated. In the long run in perfect competition, the existence of economic profits will be eliminated as new firms enter the market. As a result, the price will fall to the minimum average total cost of the individual firm. Therefore, at its MC equals MR point, the profit maximizing point, the firm will earn zero economic profits. However, the benefit is that the firms will be productively efficient because they're producing at their lowest cost level of output. There are no economic profits in the long run. Entry will eliminate profits and exit will eliminate losses. Let's move on to imperfect competition. We'll start with a monopoly. This is a firm with total price making power. Therefore, its demand curve is downward sloping and its marginal revenue curve falls at twice the slope of demand. The firm will once again produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost in order to maximize its profits. At this level of output, the price should be higher than the ATC, assuming the firm is earning economic profits and there are very high barriers to entry. Therefore, this firm can expect to continue to earn economic profits as long as it continues to produce goods that consumers like. Notice, however, that the price is higher than the marginal cost, representing allocative in effect. Efficiency. Unlike perfectly competitive markets, monopolists are inefficient. They will underproduce the good at a level less than what would be produced in a competitive market. Monopolists may not always want to maximize their profits. In some cases, they might want to increase their output, produce at a level at which their revenues are maximized. Recall that marginal revenue equals zero at the point where total revenue is at its greatest. Therefore, the revenue maximizing level of output is where the marginal revenue curve crosses the zero axis. Notice that the yellow area of economic profits is smaller than the profit maximized monopolist. However, the blue area represents total revenues. This rectangle is largest when marginal revenue equals zero. A natural monopoly is an industry in which very large fixed costs mean that the average total cost curve slopes downwards over a very wide range of output. In other words, the firm has very large economies of scale. Therefore, it only makes sense for one firm to produce this good. Marginal revenue is going to cross marginal cost at the level of output well below the socially optimal level where marginal cost equals price. Therefore, the firm is going to underproduce the good and government might need to regulate this market in order to assure a more socially optimal quantity. Industries such as public education, public transportation, and recycling and waste collection tend to be natural monopolies and they tend to be regulated by government to make sure that the level of output achieved is closer to the socially optimal level. A perfectly price discriminating monopolist is one that charges each consumer exactly what he or she is willing to pay. Therefore, the demand curve equals the marginal revenue curve. The firm is going to produce at the profit maximizing level of output where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. And this just happens to be the socially optimal or allocatively efficient level of output. There's a decrease in consumer surplus. In fact, there will be zero consumer surplus. But overall, there's an increase in welfare and the market becomes allocatively efficient. What used to be consumer surplus is now firm revenue. The yellow area here now represents the total profits for the price discriminating monopolist. 
Since every consumer pays exactly what they're willing to pay, there's no consumer surplus, but there is an increase in total surplus and the market becomes efficient. A monopolistically competitive firm is one with some characteristics of perfect competition and some characteristics of monopoly. It is a price maker, therefore demand is downward sloping and marginal revenues less than demand. When the firm produces at its profit maximizing quantity, however, the price will equal the average total cost. Entry will eliminate profits because there are low entry barriers. Exit will eliminate losses, therefore this firm experiences zero economic profits in the long run, but it is still a price maker. Time to move on to labor markets. This is where firms demand labor. Demand for labor is downward sloping. It represents the marginal revenue product. This is the marginal product of labor multiplied by the price of the good being sold. Supply of labor is upward sloping because at higher wages, households are willing to supply more of their labor to a particular labor market. Notice that the price is the wage rate and the equilibrium price in the market is the equilibrium wage rate. A perfectly competitive employer is a wage taker. This is a firm that is very small compared to the entire labor market. It does not have to raise wages to attract more workers. Therefore, the cost of hiring additional workers is the market wage rate, or WRE. Supply equals marginal resource cost, and the profit maximizing level of employment is where the marginal revenue product equals the marginal resource cost. The logic here is that the firm will hire workers until the last worker hired costs the firm exactly as much as that worker earned the firm in terms of revenue. MRC equals MRP is the profit maximizing level of resource employment. A monopsony is a firm that is a wage maker. This is a firm that has to raise wages to attract more workers to come work for it, in contrast to a perfectly competitive employer. Because it must raise the wage rate to attract more workers, the marginal resource cost, the cost of hiring additional workers, is always higher than the wage rate that it's paying its workers. For this reason, the firm will employ fewer workers and pay a lower wage rate than would be paid and employed in a perfectly competitive labor market. Our last topic is market failure. We're going to start with negative production externalities. This is a market in which the cost to the environment or to society as a whole of producing a good, that's the marginal social cost, is greater than the cost to the private firms that produce it, which is the marginal private cost. For this reason, the socially optimal quantity, QSO, is less than the equilibrium quantity of QE. There's a deadweight loss because at the equilibrium quantity, the marginal social cost is greater than the marginal social benefit. A negative consumption externality exists when the consumption of a good benefits the individual consumer more than it benefits society as a whole. Therefore, the marginal social benefit is less than the marginal private benefit. And once again, the equilibrium quantity is greater than the socially optimal quantity. At QE, the marginal social cost, the cost to society of the goods consumption, is greater than the benefit to society. Therefore, there's a deadweight loss and the market would be better off with less of the good produced and consumed. In contrast, we have a positive consumption externality. This is a good that benefits society more than it benefits the private consumer of the good. A good example is education. The more education an individual gets, the better off society as a whole is. The marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal private benefit. And at equilibrium quantity, there's a potential welfare gain of more of the good being produced. The blue triangle represents the deadweight loss or how much better better off society would be if more of this good were produced. And for our final graph, we have the Lorenz curve. This is a way of illustrating the degree of income inequality in a country. On the vertical axis, we have the cumulative income of society in quintiles. On the horizontal axis, we have the population in quintiles. The red line through the middle represents the line of complete equality. If this were a country's Lorenz curve, then every quintile would earn the identical amount of income as every other quintile. There'd be no inequality at all. However, in the real world, we have a Lorenz curve such as that we see here. The richest 20% in society earn 40% of the income, and the poorest 20% percent in society earn only 5% of the income. The closer the Lorenz curve is to the line of equality, the more equal society is. The further away the Lorenz curve is from the line of equality, the less equal society is. Wow, that was intense. I'll tell you what, that was one of the toughest videos I've ever made. If you thought that was good and you think you could use some more of my resources to help you study for that exam, please go to the link below and sign up for tutoring and order yourself a set of AP Micro class notes. Thanks for watching this video, guys. Please subscribe to my channel and recommend more of my videos to your friends. Good luck on that exam next month.